pledge allegiance to, to the flag, flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Okay. Consent agenda. Take a motion on the consent agenda. Make a motion to accept the consent agenda. Second. Motion made second. Any comments on it? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. Yeah. Okay, folks, tonight uh, we're going to present our FY15 budget uh, for the school district. The public hearing on that begins at 710. We've got a couple minutes right now. What we'd like to do is just open this up to uh, any public comment. So if you do, would like to say anything, um, please come on up to the mic. Uh, just tell us your name, please, uh, what your address is, and then uh, whatever your comments may be. Don't have to be budget-related. It could be anything that deals with the schools, but certainly then since tonight is the budget. And there'll be another chance to talk about the budget yes. for everybody that's yep. here. So. Yep. so if anybody would like to. Just not. Okay, with that, um, what I am going to do then is... As a part of the budget process, uh, we've been with the FinCom and with the um, Board of Selectmen, and also trying to work with our state rep and state senator on other issues dealing with the budget in general, state aid. Uh, so we are preparing uh, some letters. Um, because this past Monday, Dr. Detweiler did brief the Board of Selectmen on uh, special education in general in the district and the drivers of some of the costs associated with that. Uh, they were very receptive. Uh, as Dr. Yetwiler gave a brilliant briefing and really presented quite a bit of information and helped uh, folks understand uh, things that previously uh, perhaps they did not. Anyways, we're going to be sending a letter of thanks to the Board of Selectmen uh, and uh, reiterating a few of the things that we're doing uh, with the budget with them. Uh, we'll also be sending a letter to, to our State Senator uh, Jamie Eldridge and our State Representative uh, Jim Massiero asking for their continued assistance with uh, Chapter 70 funding, local aid in general to the town too. Because, as you know, there's the revenue side that um, the state will provide the town, and there's also what they may take away in assessments. And sometimes that uh, revenue increase looks very nice, but then some of the assessments uh, put against the town detract from some of those increases. So we're asking them uh, to work as best they can with the rest of the legislature. Good news is the legislature, uh, both the House and Senate Ways and Means Committee chairman, have come to a consensus. And it's good news in that it's at least uh, in the right direction. And that is a uh, promise of at least $25 increase per student. So for us, that's roughly $40,000. $40, uh, it's a long way to go from there still, but at least it's something. Something else we've been doing, and you may have heard about facilities uh, prioritization and how we go about uh, looking at all the facilities we have in town, and certainly the schools being the uh, largest number of those facilities, and certainly the uh, most expensive when it's all added up, in the total value, or dollar value. And we had a company come in, when I say we, is actually the uh, Permanent Missile Building Committee, PMBC, did contract with the company EMG to come in and assess all the facilities. Uh, and what they did is assess seven out of them, and that was the Houghton Building, uh, the Historical Society for them, uh, Town Hall, uh, and there's three, uh, excuse me, the four school buildings. So now with that, um, they came up with a list, and it's a rather extensive list. And there's a working group appointed by the selectmen uh, to try and work through that list and come up with some priorities on how we do that. And with the uh, way that all worked out was we uh, came up with seven broad areas, ranging from um, safety of life uh, through code compliance on down, including building envelopes, building interior, IT, and then finally out to uh, pavements and grounds, if you will. And then internal to each of those were priorities. Uh, so the working group has met twice. Um, first one was an organizational meeting, and I believe briefed the Board of Selectmen on that this past Monday night. Uh, we met again last night and came up with a recommendation for the Board of Selectmen that will be presented this coming Monday, the 17th, as to uh, our offerings. There was roughly $450,000 available uh, to the uh, various uh, departments and uh, committees in town, and uh, we divvied that up uh, as best we could. And there was representatives from FinCom, uh, the PMBC, uh, Board of Selectmen, uh, in the schools that were involved in that. And speaking of FinCom, uh, come May, uh, we have a uh, term coming up, and that's uh, Mr. Brian Tarbox. Uh, we've uh, sent a letter to him based on school policy uh, that his term is uh, about to expire, and if he would care to uh, reapply, which indeed he has. Uh, so we have that. Uh, 
we asked also in the general that we're required to post that there is that opening and if anybody else from town would like to step forward and that's uh, March 27th is the deadline for that and we've had one other gentleman uh, apply to that too so that's getting us pretty close to 710 um, I have no more announcements in that regard anybody else have any no <laughs> <laughs> no Yes, no. slowly. No. I imagine we'll be revisiting all of those topics throughout the course of the meeting. I'm good. Okay. All right. Just give us uh, about a couple minutes, folks, then, and uh, we'll stop right on time at 710. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Uh, Brian Travax, just just since we have a minute. Um, the mic on? Okay. Oh yeah. Okay. I, I just wondering if you know when the uh, the actual hearing will be, just because you know with kids and vacation time gets scheduled infinitely far out. <laughs> yeah, expect uh, either the end of April or early uh, May. Okay, fair enough. Thank you. Yeah, so it will be one of those two meetings, Brian. Okay, fair enough. Thank you so much. you see on the screen, um, and Kirby, can you put that on the television? That's our eighth grade in Washington, D.C., and as a um, gold star for anybody that can identify the building they're standing in front of. Well done. Nice. Pass off the gold stars. Uh, but, uh, it's the eighth grade annual trip. Uh, Mark Levine and uh, many other adults taking the eighth graders uh, to Washington, so um, they're having a great time. Okay, we're on time now. Kelly and Mike, take it away. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Welcome to uh, tonight's budget uh, presentation. Uh, the budget subcommittee and the admin team have been working on the FY 2015 budget starting after town meeting last year, uh, but we've been meeting in earnest since October of this year. Uh, we started the process by identifying our baseline budget requirements, which is typically reg regular education staffing requirements, our projected use of SPED resources, and other resources and staffing necessary to meet what is required of the district by the state and federal government, and along with you know our, our typical expenses, heating and uh, uh, maintenance for our, our buildings and things like that. Uh, we also did an analysis of those resources and requirements as they apply to the objectives that we set forth as a school committee and as well as the objectives that the admin team, the uh, superintendent and the principals have and other advisory gro groups, both internal such as our student improvement councils and external such as things like the New England uh, Association of Schools and Colleges which just did a big uh, uh, analysis of our high school. Uh, after determining our baseline requirements, we evaluated opportunities for continuing to improve and broaden the educational opportunities being offered to our students. I think we can all agree that as fine as the Littleton School District is right now, we're all aware that there is a lot more that we could do given increased funding or access to other resources uh, and also just in response to uh, changing theory and best practices. So tonight we're going to present the results of that process. As we go through the presentation, you will see that, as always, salaries for our staff remains the biggest driver of our budget. Uh, we've also identified required increases in some expense items, such as transportation, food services, athletics, and tuition reimbursement for our uh, professional staff. Uh, we've also added funding for professional development, which, uh, as we went through the budget process, we feel we've been chronically underfunding that over the past several years. But it's even now more important than it ever has been as it relates directly to our ability as a district to take advantage of a new opportunity presented to us uh, by the implementation of a new evaluation framework for our teachers and administrators. So as we talked about, uh, a lot of what we do here with the budget is related directly to our mission statement, uh, which is to foster a community of learners, striving for excellence, and prepare each student to be successful in a global society. 
Uh, we're also working on, you know, maintaining our values, the respect, responsibility, integrity, and accountability. And here we'll take a first look at the numbers. And what we have here is, you can see that we voted a budget last year of $16.9 million. Of that, $16.4 million was our appropriation from the town, while the remaining $500,000 was funded through the school department's revolving funds. For fiscal year 2015, our proposed budget is $17.45 million, which is an increase of $550,000. In order to fund this, we are asking for an appropriation of, from the town of $16.95 million. Uh, and we will again use 500k from our revolving funds to get us to the total of 17.45 million. This slide compares FY14 and 15 for salaries and expenses. <coughs> As you can see, we have a $456,000 increase in salaries, which is a 3.9% increase from last year. Expenses are showing an increase of $93,742, which is a 2% increase from last year. This is also the largest increase in expenses in many years, both in terms of dollars and percent. Uh, this is an effort to address the chronic underfunding of expenses that we've experienced over the past several years as we've been working through significant budget pressures. Uh, and the, the increase is primarily this year focused on professional development and class, uh, classroom resources. And while this is a significant increase over past years, the expenses still remain level as an overall percentage of the budget. Last year, expenses were 28.5% of the overall budget, of the appropriated budget. While this year, even with the increase, they're up, they're actually 28.1% uh, of the overall budget. The total increase for salaries and expenses is 550000 or a 3.3% increase over the appropriated budget from last year. And again, as we uh, went through the process to getting to these numbers, we try to stay focused on what we define as our priorities for next year, which is to continue to meet the learning needs of all our students, uh, assessment of the high school programming to ensure the students are attaining the skill sets necessary to be college and career ready, uh, which is an interesting priority because that is evolving. We have the Common Core Standards coming down the line, uh, and we just went through the audit by NEASC, so we're implementing and, and looking at the budget in terms of implementing some of the recommendations that came out of that effort. Uh, also, we're, our goal is the priority to maintain current student-teacher ratios. Uh, we talked about providing professional development to support the continued implementation of the educator evaluation system. And we've talked in the past about training staff and ALICE emergency proto uh, response protocols. Uh, we're also looking, uh, PJ alluded to this a few minutes ago, implementation of a facilities maintenance and repair plan along with the uh, working with the rest of the town buildings in that regard. Uh, we continue to research and implement best practices for advanced learners. And we've evaluated and addressed staffing needs in areas of special uh, education and mental health. Uh, we're also, uh, we talked about responding to recommendations of the high school NEASC report. Uh, we've talked at previous meetings about extending our partnership with code.org in an effort to introduce some uh, uh, computer science curriculum into the uh, district. We've talked, uh, especially in our capital budget, about technology initiatives. Uh, compliance with the hardware requirements for park testing, which is coming down the line for us. Uh, implementation of site-based technology plans, kind of a decentralization uh, of how we implement our technology across our buildings. Uh, purchase of hardware and software that aligns with the ISTE standards uh, for technology and education. Uh, we have some expenses related to expanded use of the Aspen Student Information System, which is being rolled out it is accessible now to parents at the high school and middle school. Uh, there is still more rollout to occur uh, to make sure that we're making full use of that. It's a very extensive system, but we're excited about our ability to use that. Uh, expanded use of technology to <coughs> enhance homeschool communication. Uh, we also have priorities related to the identification implementation of uh, district determined measures. Uh, which is a new practice that we're, we're, the staff is working on implementing. And we talked about the implementation of common core state standards uh, aligned with our curriculum materials. So those are all drivers and priorities relative to how we uh, determine where we needed to focus at the budget effort. Let's quickly go through a uh, description of the cost centers. This is the second year that we're using this cost center. So worked with the town last year. To, we implemented a, a new accounting software and we kind of realigned our cost centers a little bit. 
Uh, regular education is all costs associated with regular education programming, the typical day-to-day -day classroom experience. Uh, special education is a cost center for uh, special education with the exception of transportation, which is in its own uh, special education transfer goes into its own cost center with reg ed transportation. We have a cost center for student and staff support, which is, includes our guidance, nursing, technology, curriculum, and improvement of instruction uh, areas. We have other instruction, which is our co-curricular and extracurricular cost centers, including athletics. Uh, we have system administration, which is our superintendent's office, uh, school committee costs. Uh, we have school administration, which is school-based administration costs, such as principals and the uh, support staff in the offices at the different buildings. Uh, we talked about transportation and busing, both regular and special education. And then our last cost center is facilities and maintenance, uh, the operation and maintenance costs of our buildings, utilities, and, and things like that. So here we'll go through a, uh, each slide will show a cost center summary, or actually this will be a cost center summary, and then we'll show each uh, cost center in more detail. This shows a comparison of fiscal year 14 and 15 broken out by the cost center. It shows the total dollar increase for each cost center and the percent increase. Uh, we'll see these broken out in more detail as we move through the slides, but some things to note here. The regular education cost center shows by far the largest dollar increase and is 48% of the total increase uh, for this year's budget. This is driven primarily by increases in salaries to our teachers, which is always our biggest budget driver. Uh, and these are contractually obligated uh, uh, increases based on our collective bargaining agreement. You can also see a very small increase in, special educa in the special education cost center, which is different from what we typically see year to year for this cost center. There are a couple of explanations for that that we'll get into when we go over that uh, cost center in more detail. <coughs> but you can see at the bottom, it ties out to the $550,000 and the 3.3% increase. Some, some cost center is a little bigger than others in terms of percentages, uh, although again, the dollars really is driven by the regular education uh, increase. And in terms of regular education, you can see the uh, breakout of salaries and expenses by building. Uh, the biggest driver is $258,000 in salaries. Uh, again, this is equated to the steps and lanes that we are contractually responsible for under our collective bargaining agreement. We do have a very slight headcount increase in these salary figures. We've budgeted a .2 FTE to start teaching a computer science section at the high school, but that's the only increase in staffing for this uh, cost center. And we should note that uh, at the high school, we do have an additional 37 students from last year that we've effectively absorbed at the current staffing level, other than that small increase to introduce a, uh, a new course offering. Uh, there's also a uh, small dollar increase in expenses for regu regular education. The greater increase for professional development, which does affect regular education, obviously, is part of student and staff, of the student and staff uh, cost center, and we'll see that uh, in that slide. Okay, special education, uh, while salaries are up, this is also due to steps and lanes, uh, expenses are down, and the special education uh, cost center is pretty flat this year, but increased about $28,000, only 0.5%. We've talked about this, though, at previous meetings. The thing to keep in mind is that uh, the reason the expenses looks low is that we, uh, the case collaborative that we are a part of is changing their billing cycle. Instead of building, billing us in arrears, they will start to bill us in a year. The year that we incur the, uh, the services will be the year that we pay for them. In order to, and that's going to present a budgeting challenge uh, as we go forward, because in the past we've been able to budget pretty much on actuals from our out of district placements, or, or excuse me, out of the case collaborative because they've billed us in arrears. Now we're going to have to do more of a projection effort. Uh, and we'll see how we, we manage that. But in order to mitigate the impact on this year, what CASE is doing is, is they have reserve funds that they hold based on uh, in past years if uh, we've paid and then we haven't necessarily received all the services rather than pass the money back and forth, they just hold it in reserve. And there's about $100,000 in reserve at CASE that we've already sent over there in previous years. What they're going to do is apply that towards uh, expenses that we've incurred for services that have been provided. If that $100,000 was added back into, uh, and it is for services that we've, we've received, then in reality the SPED education line would be up about 2.5%. Um, this is a one-time uh, thing that they're going to do for us based on the fact that they're changing their billing practice. And the other thing to keep in mind is, is that 
right now we're budgeting a small reduction in expenses because we'll be able to use that reserve. But if we incur more services, the use of more services, or if we have to put more kids into the case collaborative than we've initially projected, you know, we could see that number move. Uh, we, we have reserves on our side that would be able to deal with that, uh, but it would change the, uh, the budget number uh, conceivably as we move forward. So again, this is a budgeted number now versus an actual number, and we'll have to see how it holds up as uh, we go through it. Okay, student and staff uh, support for this cost center, the salary increase is driven by both steps and lanes, but also by an increase in school-based professional development. The steps and lanes account for 23,000 of the increase, and the increased professional development is about $10,000. Uh, we also have a large percentage increase in expenses in this cost center. Of the $47,000 increase in expenses on the second line there, $20,000 is an increase in tuition reimbursement for our teachers as we've identified a trend toward greater usage of this benefit. We also have a $10,000 increase in food service support due to issues related to uh, changing dietary requirements and the uh, impact of lower meal purchases, which we have talked about at past meetings. Uh, we also had some software licenses that were up for renewal that required $10,000 in increases. And the uh, balance of the increase is <coughs> two and a half, uh, sorry, $2,500 for the VHS virtual high school contract that we have and another uh, $5,000 for supplies and materials uh, for the classrooms. For other instruction, you'll see a small increase in salaries and a larger increase in expenses. Uh, the $15,000 in, in expenses and in, is an increase to the athletic budget. Uh, we've been level funding that year by year over the past several years as we work uh, to address our budgeting pressures. But due to increased participation in longer seasons due to the success of our teams, uh, we felt that this is a year that we needed to increase this line item to sort of catch us up over the level funding of previous uh, years. Systems administration, you can see an increase of 7.3% in the uh, salary line item, about $64,000. We are budgeting an increase of a technology position, which was uh, previously a 0.6 uh, position. We're going to move that to full time. And we've also pulled over into this cost center a part time staff allocation from an another cost center. We had a retirement uh, in another cost center. We didn't feel we needed to uh, fill the position in that cost center, but we're going to pull the money that we were using over to, towards the uh, technology department. Uh, so that's driving the increase in that line item. Uh, the two moves together will increase the, the salary <coughs> line item by 28,000. Uh, the rest of it is uh, steps and lane, uh, excuse me, the rest of it is a uh, increase of 2.2%, uh, which we will see in some other slides here, for staff that's not covered under our collective bargaining agreement, and we'll talk about that in a little more detail. And again, you can see here 2.2% uh, <coughs> increase, $16,000 uh, for school admi administration salaries. Transportation, we have an uh, increase of $75,000 in regular education. Uh, we've talked about this. Last year, our, our contract was up, and uh, we signed a new contract. It had an increase. Uh, that contract was signed after the budgeting effort last year, and what we did was we absorbed the $75,000 increase for FY 2014 out of our revolving funds. But this year we put it into the budget, so it's in there with an increase of $75,000. Our SPED transportation is down $52,000. Uh, this is due in changes to uh, how far, we have a number of students that are obviously still using SPED transportation, but there's been some changes in how far they have to go and how many miles we're being charged for. So there is a reduction in that line item. Facilities and maintenance, uh, we, uh, are fairly <coughs> flat there on salaries, some small increases on uh, expenses related to some contracts that are up. And here we can see the uh, so, sort of a, a summary of the district salaries, because uh, as always, the salaries are the biggest driver for the budget. And this slide breaks down the salary increases for FY 2015. $258,000 is steps and lanes for our classroom teachers. Uh, as agreed upon in the current contract. Another 100000 is increases for other staff covered by other collective bargaining agreements. There's also $97,000 in raises for staff not covered by collective bargaining agreements. And this represents an average of, two po of a 2.2% increase for these staff. While it is an increase, it is important to remember 
that these employees went without raises for several years in a row uh, when we were really going through some tough budget times. And even with this increase, uh, their rate of increase over the past about four or five years is far below what uh, our contractual employees have received over those same years. Um, the admin team, when we went through the budgeting effort, voiced their concerns that at our current pay scale for these non-collective uh, bargaining employees, we're finding that we're not as competitive as we used to be relative to other districts, and it's becoming more difficult for us to hire and retain the most qualified candidates for various positions that are uh, filled in this uh, line item. So major budget factors, we've talked about our contractual steps, the increase in transportation costs, the Reg Ed uh, contract was up, uh, our increase in professional development uh, funding, tuition and conference reimbursement, uh, increase in district annual software costs and athletic costs, uh, district determined measures and software costs that we, you know, we need to implement those things. Uh, we've talked in past meetings and tonight about our food service support. Um, in, historically, we've tried to make that a, uh, a self-sustaining uh, cost center. We've been fairly su very successful at it over the past several years, but with the implementation of some new dietary guidelines and uh, the impact on uh, pur purchases of meals, we've had to supplement that a little more than we have in the past years. Uh, in terms of meeting those, those pressures, cost controls, uh, we're continuing to provide optimal programming for uh, in-district and out-of-district student placements. We keep a close eye on that, and we've been very uh, successful in the past several years pulling kids back in district, which is less expensive than to the uh, typical out of district placements. We continue to manage and control our energy costs by increasing energy education and implementation of uh, programming in that regard. Uh, we continue to work with other districts and collaboratives on joint purchasing initiatives. Uh, we're getting even more uh, aggressive about reduced paper use and the use of uh, alternative communication means electronic uh, newsletters and other uh, communication methods that aren't as uh, paper-based and cost, uh, cost as much. In terms of concerns as we move forward, you know, we feel like we've crafted a budget that will meet all of our, our goals for this year, um, and it's not a small amount of an increase. But uh, and we'll, we'll, if we if we can you know put to implement this budget the way we have it done, I think we'll have another very good year in Littleton. However, you know we continue to have concerns about the level of funding of local aid dollars from the state government, uh, the new billing method per the DSE for the Case Collaborative Program. Uh, we we will find it more challenging to uh, to budget for that, and we may very well end up in years where we say, well, we budgeted X dollars, but given the change in uh, requirements by students and usage of the case collaborative as the year goes on we may need to add money into that line item uh, tuition reimbursement is going up for our staff uh, we've had to meet our, our athletic costs of guys and our food service costs uh, we continue to to wrestle with how much it's going to cost us to implement the park testing uh, this, this, that's still being determined by the district in, in terms of what is going to actually be required of us uh, by the state. Uh, we obviously, we have the new development and housing growth potential impact on classroom space, transportation, and SPED uh, as we, we see how that project uh, moves along. Uh, and uh, our other concern is our continuing reliance on revolving funds. We've been more aggressive over the past several years. Uh, we can talk about... Uh, when we have our discussion, we'll talk about what our projected balance is in that is. And it, right now, it's, it's, it seems fine, um, but it is something that we do need to keep an eye on. Uh, at this point, I would like to hand this over to Superintendent Clenchy, and he will give us a uh, presentation on uh, how the budget has uh, helped our school district. Thank you, Mike. Glad that Mother Nature cooperated with us this morning and we could have school today uh, since we're on day four of our uh, snow days. In terms of accomplishments, we've organized our accomplishments uh, with the standards that we've used for our Vision 2020 plan. So we'll start with our first standard uh, <coughs> for elementary schools, curriculum, instruction, and assessment. We've expanded and implemented programs for computer-based differentiated instruction. Uh, examples of that at Shaker Lane would be Sym Symphony Math Instructional Block, uh, grades uh, transition to two. Uh, Russell Street is piloting a program called Achieve 3000, which is a reading program 
we're very uh, pleased with the results that we're, we're, re we're getting with this program at this point in time. We have a continued emphasis on the integration of technology and the use of data to meet the needs of diverse learners. We're really focusing on individualized learning uh, and uh, planning that, that uh, hits the entire continuum of our student body. We piloted a DDM, which stands for a District Determined Measure, uh, as part of the educator evaluation implementation process. Uh, by the end of next year, we will be using two different DDMs uh, for teachers, and we will use those measures to uh, determine a teacher's impact on student learning. It's part of the new educator evaluation law that was put into place a year ago. Professional development, uh, development of site-based professional development uh, councils and plans uh, at each school. Uh, professional development provided to staff and instructional practices for reading and writing which are aligned with the Common Core State Standards. If you've been uh, following what's happened uh, nationally, Massachusetts has developed uh, or, or adopted more correctly the Common Core Standards with a number of other states. Educator evaluation and smart goal development. It's been a mammoth undertaking in terms of training our staff uh, to implement uh, the new educator evaluation program along with the development of what we call smart goals. Responsive classroom at Russell Street School. It's a character education program. Again, we're very pleased with the results that we're seeing uh, with this program. Culture and climate. Principals and staff representatives have been trained in ALICE, uh, which is an emergency response program. I had uh, sent a letter out earlier this week uh, in regard to ALICE. Uh, restoration of after-school clubs at Russell Street School. This uh, money allowed us to expand the club offerings that we had previous to, to uh, having clubs two years ago, and we're very pleased with the diversity of clubs uh, that have been added to, to the program. Uh, Shaker Lane, uh, was, we were fortunate to be able to renovate the preschool playground this year. Uh, we were also able to redo the student uh, staff bathrooms as well as painting some of the areas, uh, increased beautification of the school. Uh, it was about time we started uh, taking care of paint at Shaker Lane, and uh, if you've been in the cafeteria lately, you'll notice it looks uh, a lot different. It looks brand new again, so it's really nice to, to see some uh, funds going into uh, maintaining our schools uh, in terms of first-line impression. Middle school accomplishments, uh, curriculum instruction and assessment. We're undergoing a review of our science curriculum and deciding on the direction that we're going to be taking as we go on. Uh, English language arts uh, vocabulary review, refinement of our second step program, which is a middle school uh, character education program. Culture and climate, uh, school principal and staff also have been trained in uh, ALICE. Community and communication, implementation of Aspen student information system, which includes a portal for students and parents, so parents and students can go in and check their uh, assessments uh, as the year progresses. The uh, site is opened uh, 24 hours a day. The high percentage, we have a high percentage of faculty using technology as a uh, means of communicating with the home. Uh, we've uh, developed uh, websites, uh, again using Aspen, Twitter, email, and uh, individual teacher blogs. Technology, continuation of the BYOD program, which is a bring your own device program. Uh, using iPads, Chromebooks, and uh, other uh, computing tools. Implementation of uh, center-based computer programming and engineering lab, uh, funded uh, by uh, receiving a grant, uh, a $10,000 award from code.org. We were the only school in Massachusetts that was uh, selected to receive this award. Very proud of the accomplishments of, of our staff and students in order to write the grant and, and actualize the grant. Kelly, you're off cycle with your charts. Oh, my uh, assistant is uh, <laughs> not following. <laughs> uh, keep going. <clears throat> now we're going on to the high school. There you go. I guess I'm going to have to keep an eye on you <laughs> as we move forward here. Uh, curriculum instruction and assessment uh, at the high school. We had a NEASC review this year uh, for reaccreditation. It happens every 10 years, and uh, we were uh, granted uh, reaccreditation, and they were very impressed with uh, what our high school is doing, so we're very pleased uh, with that. Uh, also, we were uh, 
named as a, a, an accommodation school or a commendation school more correctly this year and I'll talk about that a little later on this evening. That's quite an honor for uh, a school to be uh, given the title of a commendation school. Last year our middle school was granted that title. Extend, expanded partnership with our case collaborative through the development of specialized programming. This is the first year that we've had a high school case collaborative in our district. Very proud of that program. Professional development. Development and implementation of a site-based professional development model. Again, we've gone to, to school-based PD models uh, and a district model, and then we have individualized professional development that aligns with uh, teachers' SMART goals. And again, the implementation of the new educator evaluation system. Culture and climate. Staff and, and administration uh, were trained in uh, Alice Emergency Response. Community and communication. We uh, have the Aspen portal uh, alive and working for uh, monitoring of student assessment. Athletic accomplishments uh, this year, boys basketball were district champions and uh, our football team were state champions. And as a result, we were able to enjoy a, a wonderful game at Gillette Stadium. data on our high school accomplishments and, and before I, I go into this we view the accomplishments of our high school as a pre-k to 12 effort uh, it, it's something that begins as soon as a student enters our, our school district and uh, in the end uh, when we, we look at the results at our high school we're very pleased uh, with our MCAS results 99 percent of our students in ELA scored proficient or advanced 93 percent of our students uh, in mathematics scored proficient, proficient or advanced. 94% of our students taking science were proficient or advanced. SAT points, a 15 point increase in critical reading. 10 point increase in math. 13 point increase in writing. Four seniors received commended recognition in our National Merit Scholar Program based on PSAT performance, pre-SAT performance. AP results. 80 students took part in 154 AP exams. 91% of our, our students, AP students, uh, scored three or better. 32 <coughs> AP scholars were uh, named from our high school. 10 AP scholars with distinction. And five AP scholars with honor. Very pleased at our progress and, and achievement of our students uh, at our high school. Uh, that are those accomplishments more correctly or are a result of the hard work of our students, staff, and, and our parents working together to provide uh, top-notch education to our students? And I'll turn it over to Mike for concluding remarks. Thank you, Mr. Clenchy. Uh, as I stated at the beginning of the presentation, this budget represents uh, an earnest effort to meet our baseline requirements related to staffing and providing the services and meeting the requirements put on the district by the state and federal government. Uh, the budget was also crafted to closely adhere to all the stated goals and policies set forth by the school committee and other advisory bodies, not least of all our own management team. Uh, and we also try to craft a budget to do what we can to move the district forward in terms of what programs and classes we offer our students and how best to take advantage of emerging technology and practices. Uh, given all that, I would expect that what's going to follow is a very robust discussion and evaluation of all of these considerations prior to our vote on the FY 2015 budget for the Littleton School District. So, thank you. Thanks, Mr. Clenching. Um, call up slide four, please, Steve. Sit four and error. Um, a little bit on the process, uh, a little bit on um, some of our latitudes and some of our constraints. Um, importantly, uh, Littleton School Committee is not a taxing authority. What I mean by that is we do not go out and raise an appropriate or set a tax rate, a levy rate, or anything like that. Uh, that's up to the town and with town meeting and the Board of Selectmen uh, working through that. So the Littleton School Committee receives its money through the generosity of the folks in town, the state, and the federal government then some grants, uh, and then frankly some contributions too. Now the contributions don't go into the budget, uh, but they are to cover some things that uh, teachers um, work hard with, with you know, folks in the community, 
and who are, are able to raise some money for some projects that they feel uh, enhance the curriculum that uh, we've been able to present them through this budget. Um, we work, as Mike said, uh, with the FinCom, the Financial Committee in town, and then also the Board of Selectmen, and certainly the people in the Finance Team and the Treasurer's Department uh, here in the town. Um, as we go through this, uh, we present our needs based on uh, all the outline that uh, Mike just gave you. And certainly, every other department in town has needs also uh, to meet their requirements. So that's why it becomes a total team effort. And uh, even through um, just this past Monday, we're in discussions with the Board of Selectmen as to uh, the way to go. What we will do tonight is the school committee will vote on the budget. Uh, and that's the budget that our responsibility and our work charged to, by state law even, is to bring to town meeting. Um, but it says you can already make out, it's not something that's done in a vacuum. It's done with other people in town. Now with that, and the reason I asked this slide to come back up, is you notice that in both FY14 and FY15, we have a column, non-appropriated budget. And it adds up to $500,000 in both, in both instances. That was our plan, and that's what we presented to the Board of Selectmen and FinCom up to this point, is to use $500,000 from the reserves that we have, as it says there, an expense revolving fund, and be able to uh, fund the budget up to the $17.4 million. Uh, we're at a point in the town total, and Keith, correct me if I'm off too far, Keith is our town administrator, Keith Bergman, uh, roughly $500,000, the town as a whole, as to revenue available and projected expenses for the budgets for all the departments in that we have in the town. So we do have some latitude in how we use some of our reserves. Uh, and that's going to be part of our discussion tonight, is do we increase that $500,000 by some amount which means it's less that from other resources in town of the revenue available that would be used to fund the $17.4 million. Um, the, the handshake, the promise, however you want to view this, that we have with both FinCom and the Board of Selectmen is that we're going to work together as a town to bring that delta and work it towards zero. And we're going to see what we can do as a school committee to contribute to that. So I want to raise those points because that's where a lot of the conversation is going to occur, I believe, this evening, is to how we do help close that gap but then Sprinkle's probably going to have some comments too as to why aren't we doing something else? You know, what are some of the other ideas that we may have? And we certainly welcome that. Um, but as we move forward this evening, I'd like to, as I said, just please keep those thoughts in mind. And uh, say, so why can't you get more money? Well, the way we get more money is certainly um, we lobby our legislators to increase Chapter 70, which is state funding. And as Mike mentioned, that's near flat line. It's gone up roughly $30,000 or so the last couple of years. Um, that's not even half a teacher, half a full-time equivalent. And you may recall when we were doing this back two years ago for FY13, the crowd was a lot larger than we have this evening. Um, it wasn't as quiet as this evening. Uh, and we had a lot of good ideas uh, presented to us for many school committee meetings up to this actual um, bu uh, budget meeting where we would vote on the budget. Uh, we lost four, um, four, pardon the hand signals there, for full-time equivalents, and we haven't recovered yet. Uh, as Mike talked about in the regular education, I point two in the technologist uh, area is all we've increased. So we're still uh, trying to catch up. So the needs, as you well know, outstrip the resources available. And that's what we're all about uh, this evening. And it's been working towards these many months, is how to best allocate the resources that are available and get the best bang for the buck, so to speak. So with that, folks, we are going to open up for public comment. What I'd like to do first, though, is get uh, some comments from our board members here and then uh, we'll proceed from there. So, who would like to go first? Uh, I have just two clarifying questions. Go ahead. If you mind. Um, when you presented the uh, professional development, there was an increase in the line item. It, that's due to increased usage of it, not increased benefits that we're providing to the staff. Right, we've always traditionally right, under budgeted right. that number, <coughs> if I understand the history. That's correct. Could you maybe just sure. answer that just a little bit? Are you going to ask another question? That yeah, and then the second one is. I'm going to need to be up there for. Yes, it's okay. going to be for you. So. <laughs> <laughs> I had a feeling. Our uh, professional development fund that Daryl's referring to was uh, professional development that we provide for uh, teachers. It's a contractual obligation, and we budget according to past trends. Uh, what happened uh, in the past two years is we have more teachers taking professional development, which is a good thing. It uh, allows our staff to keep up with best practice. Uh, what happened this year uh, was interesting. We, for some reason, have a number of staff that are up for recertification. And when staff become recertified, it usually involves some type of coursework. So we had actually 40, 47 staff 
uh, that will be recertified this summer, which upped the cost. So we had to increase that line by $25,000 to uh, take care of the trend that we're seeing. And we also find that uh, our teachers are taking advantage of seminars and, and conferences and workshops, which we're really pleased to see. Uh, they can go take a workshop for a day to day or two and they come back with some exciting ideas and, and we see those ideas been, being implemented within their respective classrooms. <coughs> Thank you. And then the other one is, um, you know, you, you gave us the list of the budget priorities that drove to where we got to the budget today. Could you maybe just touch on a few things that didn't quite make the budget priorities, i.e. things that um, you had unfortunately just couldn't bring forward today or that will be on our planning horizon? over the next year or two? Sure. Uh, as uh, our chairman alluded to, a couple of years ago we were faced with decreasing a little over four FTE professional staff. And what had really happened is we had some increased costs in uh, out-of-district uh, program placements. And when we looked at the revenue coming in and, and the revenue that the town had, we, we just couldn't justify uh, demanding that kind of revenue to make our budget work. So we had some pretty tough decisions to make. We ended up going into our regular education budget to, to balance our budget. And as a result, we've, we've managed uh, to do fine. But what, what we've done over the past few years to, to be as efficient as we can is we've increased our class sizes to what I would consider the maximum range. We're fine at this point in time. It's something that I, I'm watching, and it wouldn't take much for us to be in a position where we would have to be looking at additional <coughs> staff to lower the class sizes. And when I look at our system, I would say right through K through 12, we're, we're at our maximum acceptable range. So any more influx of students, depending on, on where uh, they land in terms of grade, uh, would have uh, an effect on our budget in terms of having to add more staff. One area that comes to the, the top of our list, though, that we haven't been able to work out yet, and uh, our Director of uh, People and Personnel Services certainly working with me to try to figure out a solution, is to uh, hire an adjustment counselor, a psychologist, or a social worker, depending on what skill sets they have. Our uh, YRBS report, which is a a survey that our students take every two years uh, and it, it really focuses on student wellness has uh, revealed to us that we have a number of I students uh, that are having increased uh, challenges uh, emotionally and with stress and anxiety. We feel that as a school district the, the best way to uh, be supportive of, of these students is to have some qualified personnel in our district working with these students and uh, that in itself should hopefully make a tremendous difference. It's certainly high on our list of priorities. One of the uh, budget cuts that we had to enforce two years ago was a psychologist in our district. So we, we found that without having that extra, extra specialized personnel on staff, uh, we're, we're finding in that we have growing concerns in that area. Our high school, as Mike had mentioned earlier, we had 37 new students in our high school. We knew that uh, we needed to bite the bullet, so to speak, and we maintained our staffing at that time. That certainly increased our, our staff sizes. As we look toward uh, Vision 2020 or what our schools should look like in 2020, there are some areas that we'd really like to move forward in. Computing science is one. Statistics is another one. And we need to, to increase our, our partnerships with uh, surrounding colleges to make sure that our students have those necessary skill sets to be successful as they continue their educational journey. Skills that were taught 15 years ago were important skills, but they're not skills that are going to uh, uh, alone help our students be successful in a, a very changing global market. You know, our students. Uh, we have a very high percentage of our students attending post-secondary institutions. They uh, do, a, do a fine job. We get letters every year from parents and students uh, telling us that we uh, prepare them very well for, for their educational journey. But when they're getting out, their jobs aren't, aren't available for a lot of them. And we're having a number of students nationally that are graduating with four-year bachelor degrees. And uh, they're working for jobs uh, just slightly above minimum wage. And with the cost of a college education in this day and age, uh, there's a lot of debt that goes uh, along with, with their college degree. We somehow need to instill what I call resiliency skills. 
Uh, also, uh, skills that, that could be labeled as entrepreneurial because most of our students or, or youth, our future generations, are going to have a number of jobs during their career. They're going to have to retool. They're going to have to learn and relearn a, as they go uh, throughout their careers. We can't do this alone, but we can give them a good start. Our universities and colleges are going to have to really look in the mirror and uh, figure out what we need to do as a, as a, a nation to uh, become more not only competitive, but make sure that our students that are entering the workforce uh, have an opportunity to uh, enjoy uh, the careers that we've had uh, within our age groups. Does that help, Daryl? Yes, no, thank you very much. You're welcome. Alex? Yes, the question I have is in regard to the FY14 salary increases, what does the other contractual line item that increase about $100,000 this year, what does that entail? Because I know we have the teacher steps and lanes line item and we have the other category that includes staff, admin, tech, you want to answer that or do you want me to, Mike? You guys know better. What, what, I think what Alex is asking is for the other contractual, which job titles are under those, the non-LEA CBAs. Uh, yeah, collective bargaining B agreements. Uh, educational assistants. Let me pull out my notes here. Uh, secretaries, okay. custodial, uh, other other uh, okay. staff, uh, contracted staff that wouldn't fall under the LEA agreement. Psychologists, etc. Mm -hmm. OTs, uh, speech mm -hmm. pathologists. Well, those will fall under the following line. Some of the ABAs. Right, so the other contractual right. lists, the, Correct. the teacher aides, the secretaries, they all have contracts. Yeah. Right. I, I do think that the district, that Steve, Mike, and the team did a great job working with a budget that, frankly, there's not enough money in, in there. And I think we did a pretty good job of using that money as best we could. But I think many of us, if not all of us, would agree that it's not comfortable. We're comfortable with the job we did, but the position we are in is not comfortable, and that's not it's not nearly what, enough of what we would like to do for for the students, for the staff, for the community. But it's the reality we face. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I mean, I, we alluded to that at the beginning. I mean, the budget is designed, the effort is designed to meet. And, and PJ talked about this too. We're not a taxing authority, and we have to work within certain parameters that are, are put upon us. Um, you know, by the other bodies that we, we collaborate with, um, you know, there are in, in uh, Daryl's question was, you know, more along, pretty much along those lines, a little more uh, discreet was, what didn't we do that we would like to do? And Kelly hit just a few high ones, and we, the list goes on. It does. And, and, you know, the farther we went down the list, we might all have differences of opinion about exactly what's more important than one other thing, but there would be no shortage of, of good ideas, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. um, but, I mean, that's that's a, a pressure felt by all districts right now, mm -hmm. I mean, to be frank. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Kelly touched on mental and emotional health, which as you know is a topic near and dear to my heart, and I'm glad you did, because that is one of the one of the things I know many administrators, I'm surely many parents, would like to see us be able to do, and we're just not able to do it with this budget reality. And so I think when we do go to the state, and when, when we do go to the Board of Selectmen, these are the things we need to be talking about and saying, hey, this is what we need. This is whether it's the school psychologist mm -hmm. or, or whatever priority or priorities we say, hey, this is on the top of our list or near the top of our list, and we're not able to do it. And it means a lot. And behind every number is a story. Right. And we want to make those stories as, you know, academically and emotionally and physically, you know, satisfying as possible for our, for our students. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to, uh, to belabor the discussion, but what we've had to do in, in the last five or six years to make our budgets work is we've had to uh, virtually uh, zero out our resource acquisition line for textbooks, etc. In the past two years, we, we've made a conscious decision to do that in the hopes that uh, our textbooks would be more uh, e-book oriented or, or online oriented. Uh, publishers, for some reason, are lagging and, and, and not catching up to the, the times, and I have my own speculations, <coughs> which I won't share, I'll keep to myself. But uh, we're reaching a point that we, we really need to start injecting more money uh, into those lines. As a system, or any system, uh, we should be reviewing our curriculum uh, in each subject uh, every five years. We have a cyclical chart that we've created so that we're not doing it all at once. but. Uh, 
systems that strive for excellence do uh, detailed curriculum reviews every five years. And, and that drives new resources, uh, drives professional development for staff, et cetera. So we put more money in, into the professional development for staff, but we also need to start thinking about acquisition of new resources as we move forward. What are we going to do? Keith? Um, our town administrator, Keith uh, Bergman. Bergman. <laughs> I love you, man. I just went stupid on you. I apologize. <laughs> I tell Keith, Keith Richards, Richards. Richards. That would be fun. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Keith is with us tonight. After a full day, he's here tonight also with us. Um, and I'm asking him to come up right now if he has any comments. Because he's yeah. on his way to the planning board. Uh, so he's a very busy man this evening. Keith, is there anything you'd like to mention from the town perspective? Well, first off. Uh, Mike, only because okay, there's sure. not enough back there, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. First off, I, I wanted to uh, echo the uh, sentiment that there's a uh, I think a, a genuine team approach and a level of cooperation that exists between the town and the schools uh, in, in where we are all in this together and I think that our work over the uh, uh, past several years has shown that whatever the needs are if it's you know if it's new uh, school buildings or, or, or new uh, or, or major projects that are needed we, we work together on those if it's finding ways for us to do all that we need to do uh, uh, together, uh, we, we're, we're there for each other. We reached agreement on the order in which capital projects needed to go so that this building we're in now could squeeze in between two very needed uh, school projects. So, so I think that we, that we approach our relationship with the school department in, in one that is um, uh, to our uh, common interest. Uh, the, um, in, in looking at our uh, budget outlook for the coming year, uh, that uh, I'd, I'd also want to mention, as, as the chair indicated, we're working together on how dollars should be spent for facilities, and or, and through the working group, we're coming up with a, a punch list of projects that will be proceeding for uh, uh, for buildings for the coming year. Uh, for the operating budget, uh, we have a. Um, uh, we had invited our town departments to present two budgets, level staffing and what we call a mission budget, uh, where we encourage the departments to tell us what they would like to be able to do beyond what they're currently doing. And uh, they took it with gusto, and we were very disappointed when there was not a single one of those requests that we could entertain. We heard from the Council on Aging this week that about one of theirs that's near and dear to their heart or for some additional staffing which we will which we will take up as soon as we can get to it but but uh, it doesn't look like this year the overall picture in in um and what we have is an iterative process of budgeting here which i really enjoy in littleton we start off uh, with uh, conservative uh estimates months before town meeting as as we get closer uh, to the finish line, we we uh, can firm up numbers and, and try to make things balance right now. Among the ones that are that are still in the unknown category, uh, the the final number on uh, on local aid, we don't know yet. But what we're seeing, the signals we're seeing are not optimistic. Uh, the governor was proposing level funding of Chapter 70 and and uh, unrestricted local aid. The uh, House and its budget just did a little bit better, uh, about $12,000, I think, for unrestricted local aid for Littleton uh, with no change in uh, Chapter 70 money. Um, I don't know if the Senate's going to be able to, to uh, make any substantive changes to that, but it does, not, it does not look like this year is going to be one that we can count on much relief from the state. Uh, the, uh, the figures for uh, our group health uh, costs, which are one of the largest single costs that we have right after debt service, uh, we hope to firm up soon, might be in the position of saving, uh, shaving uh, about another $100,000 off of a projected uh, deficit. Uh, and in order to make things balance, we're, uh, we, I, I'd say that we're some, somewhere, officially we're somewhere round number somewhere between three and six hundred thousand dollars in terms of numbers that we need need to shave uh, and that uh, one of the figures that I know is in play 
uh, and, and has been discussed with, uh, with uh, this, this committee and with finance committee and selectmen is uh, what number you will choose to apply from your reserves. That uh, the, the number in your budget is 500,000. Uh, there's another, another suggestion is that that figure be higher. Uh, to uh, uh, $769,000, uh, you get to decide what the number is, and and, and uh, we are and based on that, then we will continue to work closely to try to narrow whatever the resulting gap is to reach um, to reach a balanced budget by the time we get to town meeting. But we appreciate very much the open dialogue that we've had with the schools. I don't think there's that either of us any of us have been bashful about uh, about <coughs> standing up for the needs of what we're here to do and and we're we're here to not only and we know that we're here not only to meet the needs of our individual departments but also to meet the needs of the town as a whole and I appreciate that sentiment from uh, from the school committee Gee, thanks very much thanks. I get the planning board to build a whole bunch of big projects that cost a lot of money to bring more taxes into town how's that well one of them was uh, yeah one of the pr uh, projects tonight is uh, there's a uh, uh, 105 uh, room uh, Hilton Homewood Suites, which is uh, which is be being preliminarily reviewed by the planning board tonight. It will go at the Sand Park, uh, the point development, and with any luck, it will be uh, the groundbreaking will be this August, and it'll be up and operating by a year from August. And we're and we've already got the six percent. Uh, 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 local Rome occupancy excise tax in place, so we're all we're we'll be ready to go as soon as they're ready to start. Somebody sleeps here. <laughs> Thank you, <laughs> Brian and Chris. Uh, I'll ask you in a moment. Uh, I just want to give uh, Chuck an opportunity. But first up, any more, Alex? No. The only thing that I would mention, since we have Keith here for just a couple more moments, would be that as we move towards the next fiscal year, there are there's one other factor that Keith didn't mention that's still sort of in play, and that's our contract negotiation, which is ongoing, and we don't know at this point where where that'll fall. So that's something that we're going to have to be considerate of as well. The reality of the, situ of the situation is that the state's calendar is far beyond where, where we are required to be in terms of our budget cycle, and that our budget cycle does not necessarily align with any of our contract agreements. So it makes it very difficult at times to figure out exactly what that dollar number has to be, and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't, and we just you know, got to do our best. I just, uh, first I'll apologize for my tardiness uh, in an effort to maintain my company's budget and my household budget. <laughs> Work kind of got in the way. But um, I, I do want to say I, I appreciate all the effort and time, Mike, especially uh, you put in, Kelly, and Steve, and everyone that's put uh, all of us, but uh, most of you guys, for all the effort you put forward, it makes, uh, makes our lives a lot easier. Uh, it's Yeoman's work, and I just want to make sure I publicly say thank you. Appreciate the effort. Thank you for everyone that came out as well. Right, you hear me, uh, you know, Brian Tarbox, Chris Hinckley here. Uh, Chris Hinckley is the vice chair of the FinCom and representative from the FinCom to the school, as Brian Tarbox is uh, representative from the FinCom to the schools. So, Brian, Chris, anything you'd like to add? Uh, yeah, you said a question. Come, Chris, on. come up to the mic because he won't pick you up that way, please. Chris Inkley, uh, Finance Committee. My question was just on um, FTEs. Uh, Mike had mentioned uh, when he was speaking to his priorities, uh, he had mentioned a 0.20 increase on technology, um, as well as Paul, you had mentioned that you guys were still, I believe you said you down four FTEs. Um, that four FTEs, that was going back to what fiscal year was that? Two years ago. Two years ago? Okay. Uh, I'm just curious, is, is it possible maybe next year could we get a buy cost center a you know just a uh, FTE uh, you know ins and outs of your FTEs from year to year by cost center um, because when we look at you know the numbers that that Bonnie kind of sent us um, just going back I believe when she says LEA I assume that's just teachers LEA um, according to her numbers FY12 you had 100 113.2 um, FTEs uh, FY13 you had 121.4 so from 12 to 13, you went up 8.2 8 FTEs. And then from 13 to 14, uh, you went from 121.4, like I Chris, said, to. Because we do meet together. 
and uh, I'm not quite sure why you, you're grilling us on numbers that way. This oh, I'm, I'm just saying I just Rather don't. And in the I don't that see you had with the subcommittee that you could have perhaps asked those questions. We don't have all that data right in front of okay, us. Okay, right that's now. fine. I'm and to be clear, the FTEs when you said just counts teachers. Uh, we have other FTEs that are in there besides just teachers. And right, right, right. And when she, when Bonnie references LEA, that is strictly teachers. And right. I want to make sure we're the same thing. Well, actually, nurses are in the LEA also. Okay, okay. I'm just saying for for us to, you know, analysis-wise. Psychologist classification is in there also. Psychologist classification, yeah. nurses. Yeah, yeah, I don't mean to grill you or anything. I'm, I'm, I apologize for that. I'm just saying. Mike spoke to it in his presentation about, a, and we can see that in your FY15, your FTEs for FY15, 120.2, so it's a 0.2 increase from 14, so we see the 0.2 FTE increase in technology. It's just going back over time in history, and y you speak into your, you know, the four, you're down four FTEs. Yeah, it's just, it's just kind of yep. hard to follow is what I'm trying to say. We it's actually talked about it recently, too. We will start tracking our FTEs by cost center because we also want to do an a training analysis of not just the FTEs, but the FTEs relative to the amount of money we spend and the number of students that we service. Because the actual number is meaningful in some, some ways, but without right. some context around it in terms of dollars and services provided and students being serviced. It really is, is only a number. Exactly. So, um, you know, we can clarify the numbers. I think what we're going to see here is is the the bucket that she's looking at might not translate directly to the way we show it, but the, right. you know, we know what our headcount is. We know our headcount, unfortunately, we know all too well, has not increased. Um, it might be a more of a classification uh, issue rather than an actual number of people that are in the buildings every day. We know what that is, and we know it's not up. Uh, but we can clarify for that for sure. And as I said, I think going forward, we will be able to do some, some more robust analysis relative to what our count is versus what we're getting out of it. Right. Per cost center? Um, per cost center, per cost you know, can right. be broken down by, you know, subject areas and, and different things like that. So, so. It's more complex than that because the special ed teachers are part of the LEA also. Right. So as we adjust the L our special ed requirements, it will adjust our net head count. So it's right. not a one-to-one -one correspondence uh, there. Right. Uh, on it, but I'm a little concerned. A few years ago, we in our old cost centers we had them allocated by schools, for example, and because of the student <coughs> population shifts, we needed to make staffing changes. Yet it was coming across as to the public as what? Why are you taking teachers away from the school? Right. And it caused a set of discussions that really weren't productive to, towards us looking at the district. I want to just be careful that as we read approach this path with what you're talking about there, we're looking at the big picture yeah. uh, and that we're not going to be making micro decisions based on a cost center right. when we need to be looking at the district as a whole. Yeah. And Chris, I would urge you uh, as a FinCom member, uh, when you need data, please come and see us. Right. Well, there's been, yeah, there's the been data. issues with, with, yeah. Yeah, with that. We, we understand that. We can that. straighten uh, that out quite okay. quickly. I would be ecstatic if I had that many more staff. <laughs> Right, right. Uh, so there, and there, the baseline is, is certainly off, but and and what we want to make sure, and, and that's one of the reasons why we created our cost centers, is, is so that everybody was talking off the same page. Sounds like we need to do that with our staffing too, right. just to make sure we're, we're right. comparing apples to apples. So, right. Thank you for bringing that to our okay. attention. Thank you. That was that was it. Thanks. Thank you, Chris. Brian. Um, uh, Brian Tarvox. I actually just wanted to. Uh, uh, compliment um, you guys, but I guess us us too a little bit. We'll start with you guys. The um, one of the things that that uh, was interesting in going through the line item budget was how things some of the things were were shifted. And, and Mike and I talked about this the other day in our conference call. How um, uh, you know some items that were just marked as originally as as teachers were then um, in this in this budget have been broken down into you know, our teacher, athletic, business, uh, and and so on. So it's a at the at the first blush, it's 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 um it's a little jarring because you know I saw one li one line item that said a reduction of 1.1 million dollars in salaries for teachers, and then you go on the next line item and see it's been broken up into more granular. So which is actually much much better. So um, for anyone who's reading the the budget um, for the first time. 
don't get hung up. Read the whole thing. It makes a lot, it makes a lot of sense. It actually makes much much more sense, at least to me. But it just takes it just ta it does take that extra little bit of, of reading. Um, uh, the other thing I'll say is, although as Keith said, as a town we're looking at you know somewhere between three and six hundred thousand uh, dollars in in a deficit that we have to close. Uh, this is this is March. <laughs> Most of the time when I've been involved in finance with the town, we've had that kind of deficit um, at 6.30 on the Monday night of town meeting. <laughs> so having, being, being off, although it, at a certain level it sounds like being off by a lot, being off by only that much in March is actually pretty good. So, I mean, kudos to all of us for... Could, could, could I just say that, <laughs> that we that it, you may recall that for the current fiscal year we left town meeting in May we we exited town meeting being out of balance knowing that we would have to go to the the fall town meeting once the final cherry sheet figures were known to adjust our, our spending accordingly so we've so if we can walk in uh, in balance will be uh, will be way far ahead of last year. Which well, just just being close, we're close. I mean that that's great, and I think that speaks to the the, the cooperation we've all had. And and this issue of FTEs f floats around. Um, I, I've spent a lot of time on <laughs> income. Chris will agree with me, saying yes, there really really were cuts because there's there's lingering feelings of oh maybe there weren't cuts. And I I can't tell you how many meetings I spent saying yes, there really really were cuts. I have friends. Who who, who you know, were cut. So it's, it's. I mean, we're driving that that misperception away, but it's, it it, it just takes time. Um, um, so I, I guess I do have one question. So would the, um, would the, uh, the the counselor um, is is. I mean, have you guys gotten to the point where like, if you found an extra, whatever the cost of a counselor is, that's where you'd spend it, or is that is that still too nebulous at this point. Well, I'm, I'm glad you asked that question. We, we are actually, uh, we just finished a comprehensive program review today and every 10 years the state comes in and, and reviews uh, uh, special education, civil rights and uh, yeah, English uh, as a second language. So uh, Rita and I had an exit interview today at 1.30 and it, it gives us some good feedback and one of the things that uh, they told us today is is uh, we're very efficient. In fact, we're we're at the cusp of needing more staff if we get if we have more students come into special ed. But uh, to to get directly to your question, we're uh, looking at our staff configurations now, and and we're we're hoping uh, that we can rearrange some of our specialty services such as ABA and and speech pathologist, uh, and find enough money to at least bring a part time uh, psychologist in. And, and I'm going to use the word psycholog psychologist in a delicate sense. I have to be convinced that whoever we bring in has the qualifications that we need to, to address the needs that have been identified in the Yarvis report. And uh, Reed and I have uh, similar experiential bases. And uh, I just want to make sure that, that we get exactly what we need, whether it's a social worker or a psychologist or an adjustment counselor. But we're, uh, we're passionate about trying to take care of that void. Can I just ask a quick question? Even though we don't have that staff in-house at the moment, students that require those services are getting those services. We're just are we just providing it in a different, albeit more expensive manner, and maybe not as time as, as well, a timely basis as we would like. What what happens at, at times? Uh, we 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 provide what we we can in terms of a first line of of support, but uh, when we look at our high school, that would be a great place to start. Our counselors are, are, are trained uh, as guidance counselors that help students maneuver through their high school career and beyond. They're, they don't have the training to, uh, to be traditional counselors that you would find at the middle school or elementary schools. So uh, most high schools that, that don't have an adjustment counselor or a social worker have the same void that we do. So we're, we're, trying, to, we're trying to fill that void. They do the best they can. And then we, the, the trick is to, to find the auxiliary services that, that are necessary, but then you need that coordinated component to the wraparound component to make sure that somebody's looking after this child and all that information is coming back and being processed. And that's where we're, I think we're, we, we need to, to improve in, in that area. So we're not, we're not, we're not uh, 
absent of, of having a process, the process could be much better than it is. Okay. And on that, on that note, it's not just that the guidance staff at the high school aren't trained specifically in this area, but it's also that the guidance staff at the high school, like so many of our other staff, are juggling so many different responsibilities that are coming on with new state programs coming in, new federal programs in, the sort of internal uh, initiatives that we continually go through to self-improve. So there's a lot going on. So that added to the fact that this isn't necessarily, this isn't their job title, but they're taking up the task for lack of a better position sort of speaks to the, the, the need there. And I'm very glad that we've had this conversation over the past several weeks. It came up in the NEASC report. They said that we needed to evaluate, reevaluate our staffing levels in guidance at the guidance department at the high school, mm -hmm. as well as district-wide. I think there's a need there. And I think Rita's been pretty straightforward about that. Kelly has been pretty straightforward about that. I'm not sure what that, what that dollar number is, or as, as Brian said, if if you know you happen upon a hundred thousand dollars, give us a call. Give us a call anyway. <laughs> but I'm not sure what that number is. <laughs> right. No, I, I just always think it's easier to ask for money for for specifics than in general. I agree. I mean, it just. But but anyway. So just want to leave. I th just say the process, at least between our boards, is going very very well. So thanks. Thanks, Brian. Wait, one quick yes. note, if I may. The Brian mentioned the more the more granular budget that has instead of just teachers it'll have teachers and then for some teachers it'll show art teacher and by subject area. Can we put that online once this is all said and done? Once we voted on the budget, provided it goes through. My you know, I'm not jumping on this obviously as you can see. And the, the trepidation is we have around twelve hundred lines and we do have uh, significant movement of dollars as a result of uh, my request to become more granular. Uh, without somebody interpreting it, without a financial background, I think it would be very confusing. So I would encourage them to come to see, if it, see us if they'd like to go through it. But I think just to put it on there, I don't think it would, it would, it would be any, it would do us, it would do any justice to the person looking at it at I this point in time. Let's, I just, let's do this for the moment. Sure. We'll make a discussion item. Sure. At our next meeting, not the next one because I won't be here on the 20th. I'd like to be involved in that. Mm -hmm. We can wait till April and make a discussion item, and then we can give direction. I'd like, like to give some thought to it. I mean, I, I see yeah. your point, Alex. I think you know anything we yeah. can do to be transparent is, is is worthwhile. But at the same time, um, I'm not 100 percent sure how transparent that is because it is a difficult document. I, even I have trouble going through, and I have to call Steve to get reminded of things I kind of already know. What is that? I kind of get with that that. Because you know the, the account names are somewhat sensical, but not real sensical. You know, and it, it can be a little daunting to go through them. So I'd like to think about what the benefits and in, in the, in the uh, potential pitfalls would be in doing something like that, so that we can make a weighted decision about you know, if are we going to do it, or if we're not going to do that, is there something else we could do that would be, you know, along the lines of what we're trying to get done, but might be more valuable to you know somebody who's taking a look what at the other context. Could be. Yeah. So let's think about it a little bit. Right. We can all chew it around and we'll, we'll so revisit put that on the uh, first April meeting, please. Sure. Okay, you guys. All right. Okay. I'm going to open up just one moment for public comment. Um, I just want to say one more thing before I do that, though. We will vote on the 17450 number this evening. The sourcing of it is not what we're voting on this evening. So how much comes from the town, how much comes from the state, how much comes from the feds. What we do with our reserves is not what we're going to vote on this evening. We'll discuss that and we'll have an agreement as to how we want to approach some of those things, more specifically the reserve and how we use it. But the 17450 is the number that we're actually going to vote on this evening. So I say that so that folks here and at home for that matter also don't see that the 17450, you know, excuse me, the $17,450,000 is in jeopardy. We don't see that. Our town administrator doesn't see that. FinCom doesn't see it. Our board of selectmen doesn't see that. So the 17450 number we feel is a good number. What happens with the state with the uh, local aid and stuff? Yeah, and we'll deal with that as we have in all these uh, previous years. But uh, that's what we're going to be discussing this night or tonight and voting on. So with that, I'd open up to anybody that uh, has questions or comments, please. Yeah. 
Thank you, Keith. It's a very small question, but I just it, it, it just because I hadn't heard it before. Uh, a couple times uh, uh, you mentioned uh, in, increased cost because it sounded like decreased um, uh, lunch purchase. Or I just <laughs> I it just I, that was just so so, so weird. I just yeah, wanted. Yeah, what to happened <laughs> is, is with a two two years ago, new dietary requirements came down from the both, feds. Both both states. State yeah, state and feds. So we had to change the menu, the offerings, the amount of the offerings, what could be offered, what can't, could no longer be offered. The new dietary requirements required more money to be spent on food. Money that, you know, we could buy certain things for a certain <coughs> price and make that plate. But now we, had, we couldn't make that plate anymore. We had to replace it with another menu item that was more expensive to provide. So our costs went up. Okay. On top of that, the kids didn't like it as much, so they stopped buying it. <laughs> So our revenue went down. So we were like, you know, it went this way. You know, it didn't, it wasn't just one thing or the other, it was both. And we've been working diligently, the food service department and the business manager, to address both the pressure in terms of increased costs and, you know, trying to get the kids to, to buy more lunch. Um, and I think we're, we're, we made some strides to it. We haven't eliminated the deficit. And like I said in the presentation, the goal for the food service budget is to be self-contained, to fund themselves. And we've been fortunate over the last several years that we've, we've done a pretty good job of that. Um, we haven't always been able to handle capital outlays, like if they have something break, but the day-to-day -day operations have been self-sustained. Right now, that's not the case, but we need to provide lunch and, and other food services, so we're going to, and we felt this is what we, have, what we had to do in order to get whole on that line item. You know, Mike, and I'd like to just jump in on that is, you know, I attended a couple of the wellness committee meetings uh, where they're looking at this issue, and I know the administration is, is looking at innovative ways of getting feedback from the students on the menu changes there uh, on it, because one of the quandaries we have is, is we can't increase the price if the kids aren't going to eat it, because, you know, I, you know, a meal thrown in the trash has no nutritional value. You know, it does nothing for the students during the day uh, there, so we've got to strike that balance and I think this year we just decided to hold the line on the cost there on the pri on the cost of the lunch so that we could try to get a handle on all the things here without just increasing the price and everybody just disappearing from the lunch program. I, I have an eight year old son so I know a little bit about what you're talking about. <laughs> I have three sons so believe me I know they're yeah. eating, they're eating <laughs> school lunch I know it. Thank you. Anybody else? Lisa? Hi, Lisa Boone. Um, I have just a comment more than a question on the actual budget. Um, I'm very aware of the FDEs that had been eliminated, especially the adjustment counselor for the district um, and uh, the dean at the, I guess he was called the dean of students who was a half time um, at the middle school, because I have a child at the middle school. And I have to say that I think um, there's really a what I would consider a, an effect in a negative way um, because of those eliminations that, you know, it would be nice if there were some tracking or some data that we had which shows um, how many students might be in need of those services and who is taking care of them, which is now taking away from the primary job that they are hired to do so that we have some ability to show where that you know difference is happening so that if we choose to try to rehire or increase that we have some you know information to back that and support you know so that people can understand that you know now the principal is taking care of all of the principal duties and what the dean of students was doing as well as you know other counselors are trying to do their best um, because that's what we're doing um, and I think it's really important to have that information so that, you know, if we decide this really is, has reached a, a breaking point where we have to do something about it because we see an increase, at least through the student surveys, of heightened anxiety. Now, why? I don't know if there's any granular reasons and who's helping them, if not, or, you know, if it's affecting our classrooms and 
you know, our teachers, then it would be nice to have that information. So I just think that, you know, as we move forward, I know it's not easy necessarily, but the more electronic we get, if somebody comes down and we have a way to just quickly input how many times somebody comes down and, and maybe a, what the reason was and who took care of it, it would help us collect some of that data and have some um, understanding of needs that are out there that are, are going, um, I don't want to say unnoticed, but being sort of absorbed by all the other staff. And it takes away, in a sense, from what, they're, what we're expecting that they're having to do. That's all. I just noticed this on the slide. It was Mike's third slide. I don't know, he was speaking to the FY15 um, budget. It said uh, non appropriated budget um, for salaries, 250000 I'm just curious, is that like grants? What is that 250000 for salaries? Yeah, so that's our, our use of our revolving funds per, the school choice and the circuit breaker. The amount that we're taking out of those two uh, funding sources to apply towards salaries and then also exp we, we split it evenly between expenses and, and uh, salaries. So obviously you're not paying, you're not using circuit breaker for salaries, you obviously can't oh, no, do that. We, yeah, we would, absolutely. Okay. Use circuit breaker for uh, Steve, I don't think you can use circuit breaker funds for its salaries, is that correct? We can use it for special ed. Special ed salaries. Tuition. Special yeah, ed. special ed salaries. Well, it's not tuition necessarily. I it's believe you only can use it on tuitions, but. Um, uh, typically, typically, what we have been using uh, circuit breaker for is tuition. Okay, believe um, the. I can clarify that. Yeah. So the two hundred fifty thousand is so that would be spent. At the, so that's revolving account. Yeah. Uh, salaries. Right. Okay. I mean, we, you know, we have a dozen revolving accounts. Most of them, though, are like we have bus fees, and that right. goes into a revolving account. But those can only be used on transportation costs. Right. I, you know, 12 years athletic of school fees, finance. those can only be used on athletics. Yep. The circuit breaker and, the, and especially the school choice, we have more latitude with. And that's why when we talk about revolving, like we spend, and it's not in this budget because it's not part of the appropriation, mm -hmm. you know, we spend X dollars on, on uh, food service costs. Like we said, it's self-contained. We get revenue from, from food sale, you know, meal sales that go right back towards providing for right. meal services. Right, I understand that. So what we're doing here is is we're doing the same kind of thing, but we're using the primarily the school choice with which we have a wider latitude towards salaries, other ex, you know, regular rate expenses, and then the circuit breaker, yeah, we're paying back into to be used for, uh, like we don't take circuit breaker money to pay for non-SPED, any type of non-SPED expenses. Right, you're right, you can't. You, you can't, right. But obviously because the SPED, the SPED budget is so large, there's mm -hmm. plenty of opportunity to use the circuit breaker revolving account against, you know, the, the monies that we're spending on SPED services. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Chris, stay up there a sec. Uh, just, just, I was going to ask Brian, but since you're already there. Uh, projected budget for the total town operating budget this year, FY15. The number offhand? Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know. I'm not... I don't know. Uh, we did bad. review the Warren articles I um, that email. I can give it to yeah, you. two days ago. Million. And, it, and it, it wasn't to play something dummy, so I apologize to you for that. It was an opportunity for the audience to see where we stand in the school budget, the total town budget. But the you know, oh, Bonnie's I working mean, documents that I have um, available right here where for FY15, and I think I said 30, and I apologize, it's 32-2 ballpark. Right. That's what she has for a total operating budget for FY15. So when you look at uh, 17.4, that's total, and that's using reserves. So when we look at town appropriation, you know, 16,950 as a ratio to that uh, 32 and change, you can see the school operating budget is roughly 50%, give or take, um, you know, point here. Right. There, and in the direction. Um, but and then, but being a finance guy, then you factor in health insurance, you and know, retirement, and debt, and it's usually about 75, 80 percent of the and town's money. That's what's going to come up next. Total <laughs> school budget, so folks in town understand. And Chris just said, when we start looking at health insurance, which Keith had mentioned also, that does not come out of the school operating budget. The debt maintenance of the buildings does not come out of the operating budget. 
that comes out of the town side of the budget, as uh, Keith had mentioned, and Chris is bringing up right now too. And notionally, a town of our size and of our evaluation, or evaluation, excuse me, it's going to be ballpark two thirds of the total town budget. So when you see, we are spending a lot on education out of total town resources. It's important to know that, and it's important to acknowledge to the folks of Littleton that they are supporting education in the town. Mm -hmm. And I could ask for us to raise our hands. Who thinks we've spent enough last year, the year before, this coming year, or will spend enough this coming year? Raise your hand if you think we've spent enough. No hands are going to go up. And to say we spent enough is a bad characterization. It's have we done as much as we want to, to, as we talk about 21st century skills, and get our kids ready for life, whether it's college, you know, post-employment, post-high school employment, whatever it might be, how we help prepare them for life. Are we doing everything we want to? The absolute answer is no. Okay? So now, our job up here, is working with the administrators, is how can we best achieve, or at least work towards that goal, with the resource available. And I wanted to highlight again that the town is working with us to make those things happen. So. I mean, even if we had an infinite number of dollars available, it wasn't like we could just all walk out and shut off the lights because we're all set and done, because that would start a probably even more difficult conversation about what would you do with it? You know, what would you do with it? Brian. So. I, I actually have the number from Bonnie. Um, the uh, the total project, uh, project anticipated budget for 15 is 41 million 463. Um, and we currently show a projected deficit of 279,000. 279,000 out of 41 million. Again, we got to find it, but but plus this is pretty. Plus 269. Okay, <laughs> but but come on, quarter mil out of 41 mil. Right. We're doing fine. <laughs> we'll we'll fix we'll we'll fix it. But that's total, and I was uh, mentioning operating. So yeah, <coughs> I appreciate your I appreciate your comments, Chris. You brought something up though that that resonated with me. We we use a lot of specialized terminology in education, and, and circuit breaker we we throw that phrase out quite often. And and uh, for better understanding of what that what that actually means is we are able to apply for money once a student costs four times the regular amount of money that we would take in for a regular education student. So let's say it's, it's probably close to 52, I would imagine, next year. So up to the first $52,000 that a student costs to educate, uh, we cannot claim anything. If the student in this particular situation costs 100000 to educate, we can claim $48,000, but then the state doesn't give us $48,000. They give us a percentage of that. Uh, next year, the percentage is 75%, but it's been as low as 50%. So it, I think it's important that our public understands that uh, we, don't, we don't get dollar for dollar back on, on expenses. And as we look at our, our circuit breaker fund and the way it's growing, over the past couple of years. <coughs> it's grown because our needs have grown in terms of special education. And we're certainly not getting a dollar to dollar return. And what happened two years ago is because that growth was so great, there wasn't enough revenue coming into the town uh, to take care of it. So we had to go into regular education to make it work. So it, it, it's not a it's not a bad thing when circuit breaker grows, but you have to realize that it only grows if our, our needs increase, and it's money that's paid back a, a, a year behind. And it's a complicated process, but I think we need to talk about that a little more often mm -hmm. to attach meaning to some of these phrases that we use. And circuit breaker doesn't cover all of this. <coughs> it doesn't cover all of the costs that are necessarily associated with a student. There are certain parameters. And by the way, um, school committee can expend circuit breaker funds on any special related special education hours? Yep. Yep. And and the one thing that Steve you just alluded to, but I think we should spell it out because it's so important, is that percent that we're reimbursed above the fifty two thousand dollar mark does not include transportation costs. Right. So we are completely uh, responsible for those transport transport transportation costs for out of district placements. Uh, for case placements and that sort of thing, and we get zero dollars back. So when even in quote unquote good years, better years, when we get seventy-five percent of 
four times the, the regular ed cost, even then we're still, it's still not that rosy. So it might be a little easier when it's 75% of, of. Less painful. Yeah, it's less painful. It's less painful, so but it's still it. painful. We're, we're still absorbing costs. Mm -hmm. yeah. Chris, I'll send you the link of the special ed circuit breaker, and you can read it. Right. Spending spending um, salaries on a grant, though, is a little uh, risky, though, right? Because grant can go up and down, as, as circuit breaker has done over the years. So yeah, if you're I mean, it, yeah, it, it, right. it is. Correct. It Correct. is something it's that not we keep. Officially wise to, to yeah. spend salaries on a, a basically a revolving account or a grant is the way I'm looking at it. From what I knew was that special education circuit breaker was just for special education tuitions. Uh, That's true, except that circuit breaker is a little different in the sense that we know we know we're going to get reimbursed at some rate, so it's not like it's going to dry up. It's just a question of how how fast the river is going to run, since sometimes it doesn't run very fast at all. But we pay close attention to that, and when we're budgeting, and I, I think he said it as a town, our estimates to our credit, I believe, are conservative. So even though we are allocating, you know, the use of revolving funds against our operating expenses, which can be a dicey proposition, no, there's no question about it, we try to do it in an extremely conservative manner. And there, I'm sure there are people that would argue that we are overly conservative and that, you know, we should run closer to the red line and take our chances because the impact on the kids would be beneficial, you know, and that's a, certainly a worthwhile conversation. But I think, I, I know that based on the amount of time that we've spent on the committee, our estimates are typically conservative and we've, not been, we've never been cut short because the whole idea of the, of the revolving accounts is to keep a surplus in there so that if your budget doesn't meet your actuals and your actuals run higher than your budgeted amount did, we don't need to go back to special town meeting to acquire more funding and we have never have had to, we've never even come close. So I, I believe our management, while your, your points are definitely valid, our management practice has been pretty good, and I'm not overly concerned that we're, we're running any closer to the red line than we've ever had before, right. even though we are using more than we have in the past, and we do keep a, cl we, we do keep a close eye on it. And right. We talked about that as one of our right. concerns. And, is our, our, right. and special, I don't want to belabor this, but special education, circuit breaker, the calculations are done by student, and you include we include professional salaries to service students, so it's included in the reimbursement as well. Okay, so but you're not using circuit breaker money to, buy, to pay for salaries. We so have not typically. We have used it for tuitions. That doesn't mean we can't. Which is what the law says. Can we do this? We, we'll can do we this provide this Chris at yeah. Prima? Provide I'll give it to him. I'll thank send you. it to him. All right, thank you. This conversation reflects my concern about the FTE to cost center's budget. We could as easily said we're just going to apply five hundred thousand dollars of this to. X and zero to salaries. Right, right. It, it, it's an arbitrary breakout here just to provide some insight into it, but we're right. going down a rat hole discussion, quite yeah. frankly, right. that's not productive yeah. towards our, our objectives of what we're here to do tonight. Yes. The point, you're right. The point is, is that right now we are projecting that we will spend minimally five hundred thousand dollars in some form or other out of our revolving accounts. Right. And, and Chris's point is right. That is concerning, and we've cited our concern yep. about that both in this presentation and, frankly, every time we've ever talked about our use of revolving funds. So it is something we're, we're cognizant of, and we try to be conservative. And, and like I say, I think even though it, it is an area of concern, I, I'm confident that our management practice is sufficient for, for the moment. Uh, yeah. Any other comments, folks? Okay, public, one more opportunity. Okay. What I'm going to do then is uh, I'm going to post the public hearing and take a vote. If everybody's ready to do that. All set? Do you need a motion to close? Okay. Motion, to motion to close. Second. Motion made and close, close the public hearing. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. Okay, I'm ready for a motion. I make a motion that we approve for fiscal year 2015 Sorry. a budget of $17,450,000. Second. Motion has been made and seconded that the Littleton School Committee approve a budget of seventeen million four hundred fifty thousand dollars for FY fifteen. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Carries unanimous. Thanks, folks. Really appreciate it. I hope you're going to hang out for the rest of the meeting because as exciting as that was, it'll only get better. <laughs> <laughs> I promise. I do appreciate you all coming out tonight and showing an interest in this.
And then certainly, as we go through the year, the execution year, uh, we do make adjustments, as uh, Kelly had alluded to a little bit earlier in the evening. Um, and suggestions on somehow we may best uh, make some of those adjustments for the year are also appreciated. So it's not just a one and done this evening. It's an entire year. Okay, public comments of any sort. Okay, oh, old business. Proposal, and that's the Computer Technology FY15 budget. Uh, we discussed this at the last meeting. Uh, Alex, you had a couple of questions. Are we able to get them resolved? Yes. Okay. Um, so we're all set on that. And I guess we need a motion on that one. Is that right, Kelly? I would appreciate a motion. Want to make a motion? Yes. I make Please. a motion that we accept the, that we approve the $65,000 lease allocated towards uh, the Appleys and the Grumbo cart for Russell Street and the high school. Nope. Second. Motion made a second for $65,000 for the IT. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. Okay. Um, we do have it listed on new business, I mentioned earlier, but I will uh, repeat it again. And that is um, Brian Tarbox's uh, FinCom appointment expires in May. Uh, we did send Brian a letter uh, notifying him that it would expire. If he would like to reapply, um, certainly uh, we'd appreciate that. He did uh, reapply. Uh, and then part of that also is we send out a general letter to the public for public posting that the position is coming opening if anybody else would like to apply. And we've done that, and indeed one other gentleman has applied. And right now, uh, the two folks, uh, Brian and a gentleman named Steve Moore, and it is um, anybody else that might be interested would like to apply. March 27th is the deadline for that, and get a package. And the package is an application for a town position. Um, I should put it this way, for a town board. It's on the town website. And then certainly a resume, and um, get that to the school department, please. And you can do that uh, hard copy or soft copy. Not yes. interested. And certainly, a lot of interest, yes, thank you. Uh, soft copy is the more appreciated, um, but if you want to do hard copy, that's fine, too. Did we set a date on that appointment? I know we were talking about the two meetings. Yes, uh, we can do that right now. Um, you want to shoot for the uh, second meeting in April? Sure. Thank you for good work, folks. You get, the, you get that date off the top of your head, Steve. I'll get it. Thank you. Sorry, right, I think. Uh, second meeting? Second, second meeting. Sorry. Uh, second is the 17th. Don't be fine. Don't mess up. I'll call me. The second is the 17th. 17th. 17th, I believe. Okay, April 17th, maybe. If any of us are still here after tax day, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so 17th, April, uh, we'll have uh, opportunity for the candidates uh, to uh, speak to us, uh, present why they may want to be on the FinCom or stay on the FinCom. Um, and then uh, certainly opportunity for us to ask questions of the gentlemen or ladies that may apply. Okay, so 17 April is it. Okay, Brian. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Kelly, you want to talk about uh, accommodation school designation? Sure. Uh, I mentioned this earlier on uh, in our presentation, in our budget presentation. I mentioned specifically that our high school was uh, given the uh, accommodation of a commendation school. And I'm going to, I'd like to read you the letter from our commissioner, uh, Mitchell Chester. It says, Dear Principal, your school was one of only 48 schools across the Commonwealth that the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education recognized this year as a 2013 commendation school for its high achievement, high progress, and narrowing proficiency gaps. Congratulations on this noteworthy accomplishment. My hope is that your school will serve as a model to schools statewide and that you will continue to make strides to ensure that our students are prepared for success at the next level. Please extend my congratulations to the entire community from administrators to educators, staff, parents, and most of all students on this outstanding accomplishment. I wish you continued success. Excellent. Just thought I would share that with you this evening. Uh, I do have one other item, uh, Mr. Chairman, if I could uh, yes, please. spend a couple of minutes uh, talking about it. This week uh, I sent out a, a letter about uh, ALICE, which is a, a method of uh, keeping our schools secure in case we ever have a situation where schools need to be put into what we call a lockdown. And I just wanted to give uh, our parents an assurance that we're not adopting ALICE to the extent of the ALICE program. We're taking sections of ALICE and, and creating age and school equivalent uh, 
procedures that will beef up what we currently do during the lockdown process. The language that we use will, will again be age specific. Uh, we would never do anything to instill fear in our children in, in the community and we're very cognizant that uh, we have to be cautious as to how we approach this. But we also have to remember folks that it wasn't too long ago where we were mourning the loss of a number of students uh, in schools throughout our nation. And when you uh, look at, at newspapers around the globe, it's something that hasn't stopped. And all we're doing is we want to ensure you that we're doing everything we can to have the proper procedures into place to keep our students and staff safe. If you have any questions about what kind of process we're going to use, I would urge you to contact the school principal and uh, they will be more than happy to provide you with further information. I'd also like to mention that we, as, as per school committee policy, held a public hearing on October 10th. Uh, we went beyond policy requirements. We sent the actual public hearing notice home to every parent uh, via email and enclosed with that email, a brief explanation of the ALICE program. So I just wanted to ensure, I know it was a while ago, and, and sometimes we have so much going on, we, we forget the process and procedures that we use. Uh, it was our hope at that time that that notification would have brought people out that had concerns, and we did have some people out, and we had a good discussion. So again, uh, I want to extend a, a, a thank you to our community for uh, entrusting us uh, with their children and uh, giving us the latitude that we need to ensure that our schools remain as safe as we can possibly make them. So, thank you. Kelly? Yes. Um, can we check to see if on the LCTV um, website that presentation is still available? Mm -hmm. It is. Uh, there. It is. So, and maybe we could put a, put a link or include mm -hmm. that in some of the information there. So. The, where they could go see the public hearing because they uh, also has this, excuse me the uh, our um, school resource officer did a presentation right. and discussed in detail where we were going with the program mm -hmm. and that might help people that may have missed yeah. we uh, can, some uh, of the background information it's on a good that. idea we can link it to our uh, web page mm -hmm. the district web page mm -hmm. excellent idea and and if I may I've heard from a number of parents who weren't aware that this was going on despite our our process this past fall and so I've link them to that information and have, and at Kelly's request, have asked them to contact their school principal. And I just want to, you know, thank Scott in particular for, uh, I know one parent was very satisfied with, after uh, emailing with Scott, hearing that, that uh, they felt that their concerns were at least, you know, respected and that they got the, in the information they needed. So I'm very grateful for that. Not that the other principals, I'm sure, uh, haven't done a good job of that. I just <laughs> wanted to note Scott because I knew that happened in particular. Sorry, John, you just got the high school commendation, so I figured, <laughs> figured it's okay. You'll level it out a bit. <laughs> Somebody throw Rich a bone real quick. <laughs> nice tie, Rich. Nice tie. <laughs> <laughs> Rich knows how we feel. <laughs> yeah, yes, he does. I just wanted to thank Scott for that, because I know this is something that a lot of members in the community were very surprised about, uh, which is too bad, because I think the process we went through both this summer and then this, this past fall was pretty extensive, and I think we made the right decision, even though it's a very difficult conversation to have. So I'm just very appreciative of our principals recognizing how difficult that conversation is for parents and for, you know, responding appropriately. Any other issues you'd like to raise this evening? Uh, just two sentences on our uh, comprehensive program review. As I mentioned earlier this evening, uh, Rita and I had an exit interview today with the Department of Education. And they were very pleased with uh, what they saw within our district in terms of uh, our special education programming, uh, our civil rights component, and also our ELL component. So we're looking forward to the report. Uh, they especially wanted to uh, extend thanks to our staff and administration and our community, the people that they interviewed. They felt very welcome and uh, they felt that we were very open and uh, uh, excited about the process. as. We, we want to become the best we can be. So I just wanted to mention that this evening. Also, I'd like to thank uh, Rita for all the hard work that she has done to, to uh, help uh, create the data for the, the CPR team. And we certainly have to uh, thank Diana Peterson. Uh, when Diana was here, 
uh, prior to her retiring. Most of the data that they looked at was uploaded during her time, and Rita came in after that, and Rita had to make sense out of all the data that was uploaded. So it was a team effort, and uh, as superintendent, I'm very proud of, of uh, uh, what we've, we've done in that area, and, and obviously the, the feedback that we received today. When does that report come out? Uh, sometime in September, most likely. And we have a financial audit of it next week, too. Okay. Right. If you would ask a question, and one second, Lisa, please. And it's because we talked about uh, meeting dates uh, before we close the meeting, or Lisa's going to say something, then we'll close. But um, you asked about April 17th being the Thursday before our uh, oh, right. vacation. Thank vacation. You. Yeah. Everybody can make 17 April? I will not be able to, no. Okay. But that doesn't. I'm just. Oh. <laughs> well, Daryl's not happy. Okay. At least right now, we anticipate we can yes. make 17 April. Yeah. Okay. 17 April remains then. Lisa, please. Um, I just wanted. Uh, I'm here, uh, Lisa Boone, for CPAC. Um, I wanted to first say thank you very much for your support. Um, last meeting, there was an announcement about our most recent workshop that we held. Um, it was on anxiety and it was really very successful. We had quite, quite a turnout and we were really pleased at the amount of people who, who did come out that evening and we got really great feedback about the workshop. And so we really we want to thank you for your recognition and support. And I just wanted to announce that our next um, workshop, which is really um, being coordinated with um, Pupil Services Director Rita, it's a workshop on the fi on 504s. Um, and it is Monday the 24th, so it's prior to the next meeting you're going to hold. So I just wanted to be able to put that date out. It's at 7 p.m. in the Kiva Room in LHS for anybody, uh, parents, but staff, anybody who um, wants more information um, on 504 plans. So thank you, Lisa. Thanks. Okay. Else? All right, uh, we do have need for an executive session this evening. Mike? I will uh, make a motion that we adjourn from open session into executive session with no intention to return to open session for the purpose of contract negotiation strategy discussion. Second. Any motion made, second to go to executive session with no intent to return to open for right. contract negotiations. Alex? Aye. Mike? Aye. 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 And before you shut TV off, I want to and am I remiss, and I apologize to you guys. Great job, Mike. Great job, Steve, Kelly, and the staff. Everybody who helped you guys down there in the buildings, please thank them. Uh, we got a good number, best number we could get. Let's put it that way, but it was hard work to get that number. So thank you. Thank you.